I think our biggest horror story was trying to get those creatures to work and be believable. So more often than not, our first real test was on camera while we were shooting. And when you figure out that something didn't work, we would stand there and go, well, now what? So there's a lot of creativity, like the Roger Corbin School of Creativity, where you got to work with your limited resources. How do you make it happen? Well, I was a big film lover in college and uh, loved storytelling. Didn't want to work in the publishing business on the East Coast, so moved out to California. And my first job was with Roger Corman, who was then king of the B-movies. After I worked for Roger, I went to work for a producer at Warner Brothers named Tony Garnett. Um, and after that, I went to 20th Century Fox and worked for Gail Hurd and Jim Cameron, who just signed a overall producing deal there as they were finishing up Aliens. And I worked with Gail for many, many years. She also came out of the Roger Corman School, so we completely were of a mind about our approach to movie making. And one of the things that we discussed, I think in my initial interview with her, was the idea that we both missed making small budget films outside the studio system. And so her main company was Pacific Western Productions, but she talked about wanting to create another entity called No Frills Films that would make movies particularly under a certain price point and always with a first time writer director. So that made me jubilant to sign on. So once the script came in uh, and we got it set up, there was very little rewriting work to do. Um, and I think the first thing that we did is Jenny Nugent, who was the line producer, Ron, Brent, Steve, and I went flying around the Southwest trying to find a location to shoot the picture. We went to Utah and I remember Moab pretty vividly. And we went to Arizona and perhaps Nevada. And then we went up to Lone Pine and that seemed to be the right place. So um, I did the location scouting with the guys. I did the casting. I was on the set for the whole shoot, post-production, marketing, advertising, release, sort of all the way from the beginning to the end. For me, relative to all my Roger Corman movies, this was a big budget film, but I think we had just finished doing Alien Nation and maybe, I can't remember, another big budget studio film. Um, so this felt like we're gonna go up to the attic, get the costumes and put on a play a little bit. You know, it was much more fun. And I have to say, in my entire career, I've never had more fun on a film shoot. Uh, it, we were isolated in the middle of the desert. It was a group of people that got to know each other very, very well. There was only one bar in town, which was where we all met every single night. Um, and the, we were all spread out around, I think, three different motel areas, but you were with these people 24 seven. And it was also interesting for my experience in a film shoot that because of the nature of the story, our shooting day was from sun up to sundown. So we were never really night shooting other than maybe one or two exceptions. Uh, but for the most part, we were shooting during daylight hours. It was a hundred and something degrees every single day in the desert. We built the town of perfection. And so there was no shade, there was no cover, there was nothing. So we all got baked in the desert during the day and then we hit the country western bar at night. Brent and Steve were a never divergent unity. They were always completely in agreement. I think it was because they had conceived this, written it, they'd known each other forever. Um, they always had a united front and they were very clear on every, anything creatively that was in the script. Now I did get to work a little more closely with Steve because Steve shot the second unit, which I line produced. Um, and so Steve and I spent a couple of days out in the desert trying to work with some very weird uh, mechanical effects that some of which worked and some of which didn't because we were R&Ding a lot of our effects as we went. I mean, the effects was the biggest problem sort of facing this picture. So um, anyway, but I worked with Steve and he was also very meticulous about that. And he was organized and everything was storyboarded. And we knew exactly what we had to do. <laughs> Part of the fun of Tremors is the fact that 
it's got its tongue kind of in its cheek. If the monster was too perfect, the movie maybe would be less entertaining and it certainly wouldn't have become a cult classic. You know, you love to love a movie that is a little bit of a shaggy dog. Oh, had a lot of challenges with the effects. I do remember there was the scene with Conrad and Bibi. He gets sucked underground. She goes into the station wagon and the station wagon was supposed to be violently pulled down into the earth and we couldn't make it work so that became just a pull away and a shot of some headlights going up into the sky. And again that's the Roger Corman technique is figure out how to tell the story the most economical way possible. My husband, the then cinematographer, was kind of a genius at sort of helping the ones that had to be shot in real time look better than they probably might have otherwise. But that was a challenge. I was running Gail Hurd's Pacific Western production and the low budget entity called No Frills Films. Our first No Frills picture was a script we bought by a young kid who was at NY Film School, I think had just graduated named Andy Fleming. And our first No Frills release was his directing debut called Bad Dreams. He hired Alexander Grzynski to shoot that movie. Uh, I met him on the set numerous occasions. I thought he was incredibly arrogant. Really cute, but incredibly arrogant. Didn't know at the time it's because English is not his first language. It's actually his eighth. Um, he's a, an amazing linguist. But anyway, um, and we didn't get along. And when we came time to do Tremors, I remember Ron Underwood coming to me and Gail and saying, well, I'd like to hire Alexander Grishinsky. And my immediate thought was, oh, no. I mean, he's talented, but I don't know. Anyway, Ron insisted, or Alexander was hired, and then Alexander and I ended up getting engaged on Tremors uh, on the exact same rock where the characters pole vault. To this day, I'll see the movie come on at night and my children will be around and I'll go, oh my God, there's Tremors, the most romantic movie ever made. And they're thinking, you must be crazy. But we look at that and to us, we don't see a man eating giant monster worm. We see the place we fell in love. But it was a very fun set because everybody was young and enthusiastic and you weren't being paid a ton of money so you were there because you genuinely it's the last movie I worked on where I think people genuinely loved film that was a lot of the reason they were doing what they were doing um, but you know the shooting was pretty straightforward it was hot and so we maximized our days I remember we had giant um, buckets of water with ice and bandanas in them so that every 10 or 15 minutes you could grab a new one of those and put them around your neck and over your head. Um, but you know other than some of the uh, effects not quite working the first time or the second or the fifth or the 25th, um, actually everything pretty much went right. We fixed a lot of the special effects in post. some changes made with the score but for the most part it was really about getting the effects right and I think at the time Universal was a little baffled by the movie because it its price point was substantially lower than the movies that they put out but it was a little higher than your average indie film because of the special effects and so to some extent I think knowing how to sell it also because it was a movie that wanted you to both laugh but have experienced genuine horror. It's a little tricky about figuring out how to convey that. The original uh, title was uh, Graboids and then it was Beneath Perfection and then we tried out Dead Silence and then we came to Tremors. We did a lot of title testing, at least Universal did a lot of title testing before we arrived at that. The Universal marketing people were very clever about kind of trying lots of different things. There is a, an image that never made it to the one sheet, but I may have the only one of these that exists because I think they did a lot of different prototypes. 
This was supposed to be a PG-13 movie. There were a lot of F-bombs in the film that ultimately we shot coverage for. You know, we knew even in pre-production we needed alternative takes for that because the notion that I think the, the trilogy of filmmakers Ron Britt and Steve had was that this would be a horror film for the entire family. That the horrors, you're not going to see a lot of blood and gore and a lot of the limitations of having the monster be hidden underground were also assets for us in terms of creating suspense as opposed to gore horror. I think it is magic when it works. I also think that the sort of the the ghost sort of lurking around underneath and probably on high above tremors is not even a ghost. That's Roger Corman. I think Roger, without the many people on that set who had worked for Roger um, or been trained by Roger or who had been influenced by the low budget horror movies that he made, particularly the Edgar Allan Poe cycles, I don't think Trim I know we would have never had no frills films. I doubt Tremors could have been made. It was that level of expertise. And again, this is Gail. This is one of her strengths. Um, that's what allowed it to happen. So in a weird way, he was sort of the godfather of this movie. And I remember after it came out, getting a call from him and he quite likes it you know he said in a very it's quite a good film so that seemed like high praise indeed because he was hard to please the movie did not initially do huge business and I think there was I don't know if that's the time or the fact that it was a weird hybrid being a horror comedy um, it didn't rack up the kind of giganto numbers we were all dreaming about we thought you know this this is gonna be huge and it wasn't and I think for a big studio to keep throwing money at a little movie that doesn't seem to have traction is a tricky proposition or at least it was back then it came out and it underperformed and I think it I don't know how long it stayed in the theaters but there was a sense of I guess everybody got their money back <laughs> which is why it is an absolutely extraordinary shock that now 30 years later multiple trimmers movies have been made that people actually have discovered this little shaggy worm that they have any interest in it whatsoever um, it's kind of extraordinary I mean I think all of us associated with the original film can't quite believe that because at the time it didn't feel like we had succeeded wildly I think now it feels in hindsight like maybe we did a little bit better than we thought